Again, we bid you good morning, happy Sabbath, and we welcome you to the lesson study for this particular week. We are on lesson number six. The title is Unlimited Possibilities. Unlimited Possibilities. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll launch out into our study for this week. Shall we pray? Father God, Again, we praise you and thank you for your word and the power of your word. And we thank you for an opportunity to study your word, to learn truths, but more than that, to learn how we can better serve you, how we can more effectively use those talents that you have entrusted to us, how we can be witnesses, faithful witnesses for the cause and kingdom of Jesus Christ. Bless us just now, dear Lord, as we study your word, because we need to hear a word from the Lord. Thank you for your presence and your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Unlimited possibilities. Now, I must, I must warn you, I'm not quite sure how much of the lesson I'm going to delve into. Uh, I've got a stack of notes here that I brought with me, and I want to talk about some of these things, and some of them will, of necessity, pull us out of the lesson study, per se, um, but they are, they are attendant to, they, are, they certainly uh, feed into the lesson study, but there's a couple of things I want to cover, some things that we did when I was pastoring that uh, appertain to this particular subject. So we're going to go back and forth into the lesson because there are some really good notes in here, some really good things that we uh, want to cover from the lesson, but also some things that I want to sort of add to the lesson, a little adjunct to the lesson um, for our study today. The memory text uh, for the lesson is, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. I want you to stay there because we're going to refer to the next several verses as we work our way through the lesson study. When I look at this lesson study in particular, it reminds me of those days back in the 70s and 80s, somewhat into the 90s, when the church was very big on giving spiritual gift tests. And if you've been in Adventist for uh, any number of decades, you remember when the church was giving spiritual gift tests. I, uh, as a pastor, my church is then uh, Amityville, Springfield Gardens, certainly Ephesus. I gave all of my members spiritual gift tests. These tests were designed to uh, find out what, particular spiritual gifts you had and how you could best use them for the cause of Christ. There are many who thought they didn't have any spiritual gifts. There are, there are many who thought they couldn't do any for the, anything for the cause of Christ. Yet we know and understand that everybody has gifts that they can use, that can be used in the advancement of the kingdom of God. So that's, that's a sort of bedrock prima facie understanding that everybody has something that can be employed in the service of the Lord for the advancement of the kingdom of God. If you're coming to church, preaching, praying, singing, whatever, and going home, you are doing yourself and your Lord an egregious disservice because you probably have gifts that you know not of that can be used to advance the kingdom. Everybody can do something. That's the, the ground floor understanding. Everybody has something that they can do to advance the kingdom of God. There are some people who, we, when I was at Ephesus, we had a group of people that we called greeters. They were a group of people voted by uh, the, the church board. These were people who had the ability to smile and be pleasant uh, on Sabbath morning. And uh, some of these faces were the first faces you wanted to see when you came into church on Sabbath morning. Uh, these were ladies and, and, and a few men who just had the love of Jesus and the joy of Jesus in their lives. And so we, we use that ability to smile and to be pleasant and to be inviting. And we turned it into a ministry, uh, a group of oh, uh, about 40 people uh, in total, 
Um, we used, I think, four or five each Sabbath, so they didn't have to come every Sabbath to do that particular duty. They, they rotated. But these were people who, when you got to church, they met you at the door, usually a little gift in hand. They smiled. If you were not familiar with the church, they would escort you to a seat. They would um, uh, talk with you, give you a bulletin, just give you a very nice greeting and allow the love of God to shine through them to the visitors. And um, uh, they liked doing that. Uh, after a while, they, they bought uh, outfits together and the guys bought ties that matched. And they were part of this, this ministry that was simply called Greeters. And uh, they did a very, very fine job. There were some people who wanted to be part of the Greeters, but they didn't have the countenance for it. They didn't have the, you know, some people, you, you don't want it to be the first face you see on Sabbath morning because they're just kind of a sour kind of face and didn't have that joy. So one of the first requirements was to be able to smile, to smile even when you didn't feel like smiling. And we turned a smile into a ministry that we called greeters. And uh, uh, my, my point is, everybody has something they can do for the Lord. When I left the Ephesus church, there were around 50 or 60 people. And of course, we had a church of over 2,000 members. So we certainly had uh, the personnel, but there were about 60 people who were uh, part of the greeters, several entr entrances to the church. We used about five or seven per Sabbath. So basically you function once every month or once every two months. So it wasn't a strain. Uh, it was something that they could do and that we felt was a very, very good asset to the church and to the cause of Christ. So my point is everybody's got something they can do. And God wants you to find out what that is and employ that into uh, the service of the Lord. Uh, the first reading I have, and I want to uh, re-emphasize this, I believe that we have used this once before, but um, we will probably come to it again because it fits so well with what we've been talking about the last several weeks and uh, most of this quarter. It comes from the Review and Herald, August 24, 1886. So just uh, two years before the famous 1888 General Conference in, in Minneapolis. Ellen White says, It is the purpose of God that the plan of salvation shall not be wrought out independent of human instrumentalities. You understand that? It is God's purpose that the plan of salvation shall not be wrought out independent of human instrumentalities. God wants to use you and I as integral parts, as hands and feet, of the plan of salvation. She continues, He has not chosen angels, but men, and women of course, of like passions as ourselves to proclaim the gospel to the human race. God could have chosen angels. Had he wished, I suspect he could have chosen uh, individuals from other worlds, but he chose men and women, frail, feeble men and women, who, when empowered by the Spirit of God, can do mighty things, speak mighty things, do mighty deeds for the cause of Christ. So he's not chosen angels. Angels could do it and could do it well. But he's chosen you and I to join hands. And, and the thing is, uh, you know this well, that when we join hands with God and do the work of God, we are not only a blessing to those to whom we minister. It is conversely true that we ourselves are blessed. So as you give blessings, you receive blessings. And one of the best ways to relieve yourself of a spiritual malaise, a spiritual funk, dare I say, is to do something for someone else, is to order your life so that you are a blessing to someone else and you will find in turn that it is a law of faith and a law of love and a law of the kingdom of God that as you become a blessing, you in turn receive blessings. Your faith is encouraged. Your faith is strengthened. Your walk with Christ is made that much more certain as you allow God to use you to be a blessing you in turn are blessed. Paul says, 
We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So that when something good happens, when something good comes from what God is doing to you, for you, with you, and through you, the glory does not go to you, it goes to God. So the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You can't take credit for anything good. You can't take credit for any soul that is converted. You can't take credit for any life that has changed. You can't take credit for anyone who puts down the bottle and picks up the Bible. You can't take credit for any of that. That is the power of God and the Spirit of God working through you. And of course, the glory has to go to God from whom that power has come. It was that he might receive the honor that this work was committed to weak, erring mortals. It was that he, that is God, might receive the honor that this work was committed to weak, erring mortals. Amen and amen. Being the feeble instruments in his hands, all the glory of their success would naturally be reflected upon him, that is upon God, the great master workman. So if anything good comes out of our lives, if anything good comes out of our preaching, our teaching, our living, our loving, if anything good accrues from those things that we do for the kingdom of God, the glory must go to the kingdom of God because the power comes from the kingdom of God, comes from God through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And after he has, in his wisdom, instituted this plan, I want you to get this. We have no reason to expect that the work will be accomplished without the ordained means. What is she saying? She is saying simply this. God put the plan together. You don't have any reason to expect that differing from the plan, altering the plan, straying from the plan, changing the plan is going to uh, have the same results. The results come when we follow the prescribed plan. And the plan is we submit ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. We sacrifice ourselves. We yield ourselves to God and to his Holy Spirit. And then God works through us to make us a blessing to the world. Ellen White says, and we read this some time ago. I don't believe I have it with me today. It just popped in my mind. She says, God doesn't work miracles to advance his truth. For the most part, he doesn't do that. He has means and methodologies that he uses uh, in order to advance his truth. So if we sit on the couch and pray for our next door neighbor, but never get up and go next door and witness to our next door neighbor, neighbor, God might work a miracle in behalf of your next door neighbor, but odds are he will not because it's your job to remove yourself from your couch, go over and witness to your next door neighbor. Now that doesn't necessarily mean uh, doing a Bible study or something like that. It, it may be something as simple as uh, helping them water their lawn, helping them wash their car, taking over a meal. And uh, I've got a story that I'm, I'm almost tempted to jump, to jump into about a meal that ended up making a, 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 a baptismal candidate. Uh, it's a very beautiful story, but it's gonna take some time. So I don't think I'll give it just now, but you follow what I'm saying. Uh, here's the, the, the rule of faith that I always use. Deeds of kindness tear down walls of separation and build bridges to salvation. Everybody, regardless of your uh, abilities, your education, your ability to articulate your facility with the English language, everybody can be kind. It doesn't take a PhD or an advanced degree or even an undergrad degree to be kind. Deeds of kindness tear down walls of separation, build bridges to salvation. And kindness is a ministry that can be used to advance the kingdom of God. Here's something that is not in the lesson that we do well to remember. No one, I want you to hold on to this thought, 
No one has ever been won to the kingdom of God through the efforts of somebody that they did not like. Now let that wash through your mind for just a second. No one has ever been won to the Lord through the efforts of an individual that they did not like. And that is because human beings tend to see God in and through the lives of those who represent him. Consequently, if you are a nasty, foul, irritable, self-centered individual, no one is going to see the Lord through that. Consequently, your ability to minister for God is going to be thwarted. No one has ever been won to the kingdom of God through the efforts of a person they did not like. The truth is, human beings being what they are, if I don't like you, I probably cannot see past you to your God. I got to like you first, then my like love for you leads me to like love for the God that you serve. So that means you've got to be present. You've got to be loving. You've got to be Christian. You've got to be God-fearing. You've got to be uh, a right fit representative for God. And then the Lord will use you to shine the light of his love into the lives of others. Let me finish this reading. Hence, it is important that all who have been made partakers of this great salvation communicate to others that which has been made known to them. So it's God's plan that we who are partakers of salvation share what we have learned, share the experiences that we have had, that we share what we know and what has been made known to us. Uh, on the Sabbath afternoon portion of the lesson, I just wanted to, to touch on a couple of things that um, the lesson says here. The Bible uses different expressions to describe our calling before God. We are to be light of the world. We know that. Ambassadors for Christ, royal priesthood, um, salt and light. There are many, many expressions which, which uh, sort of give voice to what God wants us to be. He wants us to shine for him so that those who see us will give him the glory. He, he, he qualifies those whom he has called. Um, that's the back end of a statement that, that says God does not call the qualified he qualifies those he, whom he has called. In other words, once we make ourselves willing and available to God, God will enhance those gifts, talents, abilities that he has given us to uh, sharpen our ability to witness positively and effectively for him. So don't fret over, do not concern yourself about what you don't have as compared to what someone else does have. What you want to do is find what gift God has given you. Given the understanding that everybody has something. And if you don't know what yours is, then your burden for prayer ought to be, Lord, show me what you've given me because I know you've given me something. I just got to find out what it is, and then I've got to employ it in your service. Now, let's go over to Sunday, which talks about the differing gifts united in service. Um, the lesson asks the question, have you ever looked at the, the disciples and how different they were? Temperament-wise, um, they differed greatly. And if you look at the average church, um, as a pastor, pastored seven or eight churches and all of them fairly large, a um, uh, couple of them in the one 2,000 member range, you've got all these people 
with different talents, different abilities, different um, desires, different likes, different dislikes. And as a pastor's job, you've got to try to get them motivated to do something for the Lord, given their abilities. Now, there are, the, there are some who will readily step outside of their comfort zone. There are some who like to try new things for the Lord. And Ellen White says, in these last days, we're going to have to try some new things. We cannot always go back to the old way. We've got to try some new things and get new results. But there are others who don't like to step too far out of their comfort zone. They want to kind of stay close to home. Well, we've got to minister to them too and give them uh, the tools to use their gifts in ministry also. Um, we talk about the different kinds of things uh, that we can do, but um, the, 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 the key is that we use that which we have. Now, what we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's go to verses 12 and 13 and uh, look at how the Bible um, displays this and how it uh, is spoken of in the Word of God. I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm at verse 12. For as the body is one and has member, many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, this is verse 13, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Excuse me. Verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So, again, it's one church. It's one body. There are many members. Each has been given a particular gift for the upbuilding of the kingdom of Christ. Now, i got to jump into a story very, very quick because my time is going to get away from me. Um, I've told this story many, many times, but it's a favorite of mine because it's true, and I, and I stood back and watched it. Um, uh, my wife, Irma, is from Panama. I had a treasurer at my Freeport church, Ebenezer Church in Freeport, who was also a Panamanian, a little short woman who loved to cook. Oh, she's just a wonderful person. When I got there, the head deaconess was a woman that was notorious for not uh, liking Seventh-day Adventists. Well, how is this person who doesn't like Adventists, how is she now the head deaconess in the Adventist church. Easy. Uh, her husband was a faithful deacon in the church. He uh, got sick, had a rather protracted illness, and then he died. Um, there were a lot of, of, of uh, people who came by and visited him, and, and the church really uh, showed the love of Christ during his illness. But after a while, as you know, your interest fades and you move on to other things. And so uh, after the funeral, um, things kind of went back to normal. But this one uh, uh, treasurer of the church, this Panamanian letter lady, did not forget about, uh, her name was Roberta Carter. And uh, she had two sons, big grown boys. And what sister, uh, her name was Josephina Ashers, what she did actually was she made a, a fish dinner for her every Friday. She brought the cups, the plates, the bowls. Uh, she brought... Uh, what's called Escovich fish, which is a way of preparing fish in the, in the West Indies, in the islands, and a potato salad and, and vegetables and dessert and just everything. Uh, didn't preach to her, didn't try to give her a Bible study, just, just fish evangelism. And I, 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 I uh, was amazed when this story was related to me uh, by Roberta Carter. Um, week after week after week, for six Fridays, she would come, she would uh, pre-cook the dinner, she'd set it out, heat it up, the family would eat, she would uh, always use paper plates so she, there was no washing and <coughs> excuse me, cleaning. she just fold them up, put it in a garbage bag, put it in the back of her car, and went home. Six weeks. No Bible study, no 2300 days, no keep the Sabbath, just fish evangelism. After six Fridays, Roberta Carter said, you know, tomorrow, when you're going to church, why don't you come by and pick me up? And she did. And from the day she set foot in the Ebenezer Seventh-day Adventist Church until the day she passed, she never missed a Sabbath. When I became pastor, she was already the head deaconess of that church. Why? Because deeds of kindness 
tear down walls of separation, and build bridges to salvation. Everybody's got something that they can employ for the cause and kingdom of God. For um, Josephina Asher's, this little shy Panamanian woman who was a great accountant, but by no means was she a public person, couldn't preach a sermon, didn't even like to talk that much. She let her figures do her speaking. She's an excellent treasure and uh, uh, a, a great person, but not a public person. Her gift was in the kitchen, an excellent cook. And she used that gift to honor Christ and to show the love of Christ. And so after six weeks of cooking for Roberta Carter, on the seventh week, Roberta Carter said, take me to church. And when I got there, a oh, year and a half later, Roberta Carter is the head deaconess of the church because she was loved into the church because somebody used their gifts for the kingdom of God. God delights, I'm back in the lesson now, God delights in taking people of different backgrounds with different talents and abilities and imparting to them gifts for service. The body of Christ is not a homogeneous group of people who are all alike. It is not a country club with people of the same backgrounds who all think the same. No, it's a dynamic movement of people and each of us are different, but, but our difference in our difference is our strength. Different people looking at things different ways and doing things different ways. I'll tell you a secret. Um, uh, the Lord led me into, and I'll put it this way, a, a roller skating ministry. When I was uh, pastoring, uh, I was, back in the day, a, a fairly accomplished roller skater. Uh, in fact, I was pretty good. Well, I worked with the local television station, or rather radio station, in New York City to have a Christian skate night. And uh, we would uh, skate to Christian music, and then at 9 o'clock we'd sit down and have a Bible study each, uh, each Monday night. And I dare say I led more people or as many people to the Lord uh, in the roller skating rink as I did in the uh, pulpits of, of my, my churches. And I remember uh, uh, I did a roller skating exhibition at the General Conference um, uh, oh, several years ago. And um, I was kind of getting up in age and uh, someone said, are you going to, what if you fall? Uh, and I said, well, I, I'm not going to fall. Um, either when you get my age and you're on roller skates, either you're very good or you're crazy. And I am not crazy. So I did that roller skating ex exhibition at the General Conference, talking on the same subject, using whatever you have, whatever is in your hand, whatever gifts God has given you, using that for the kingdom of God. I, I can recall a lady uh, whose husband died. She used to come to my roller skating class. And uh, I had a chance to, she asked me to preach her husband's funeral. And um, she joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it was the direct result of, of, of roller skating. So there were those who came to the Lord and uh, through roller skating. Can roller skating be a ministry? Anything can be a ministry when it's yielded to Christ and under the control of the Holy Spirit. So uh, whatever part of the body of Christ you are, a head, a hand, a foot, an eye, a toe, an eyelash, whatever God has given you, use that for the kingdom of God. On Monday, we talk about the giver of all good gifts. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, again, we looked at that. Um, all good gifts come from the Lord. If it's good and it's the building of the kingdom of God, it comes from the Lord and ought to be dedicated to the Lord. And here's the thing that's excited, exciting about using your talents for the Lord. You don't have to fret about the success or how good it's going to turn out because if it's from the Lord and dedicated to the Lord, you can relax. The Lord is responsible for the success. The success is not yours. It's God's. So then when it turns out well, the glory is not yours. 
It's God's. And the glory goes to God. What you have to do is simply find out what your gift is and use it for the glory of God. I'm back in the lesson. The Bible is clear. God has a special assignment for each one of us in sharing the gospel with others. In Jesus' parable of the householder who leaves his house to his servants and asks them to care for it, the master of the house gives his servants their appointed work. All of us have an appointed work. We've sort of gotten into this Laodicean mindset, come to church, spend an hour. Some people, if they don't get out by 12 o'clock, they are disquieted and disturbed. They want to get in and get out, and they figure they've done their bit for the Lord. If that's all you're doing, I say again, you're doing yourself a, distur a disservice, and you are not fulfilling your, your, your role, uh, the call that God has put on your life. Um, there's a letter written by Ellen White in 1903 of a fellow that um, um, Ellen White wanted to sort of jumpstart to use his gifts for the Lord. One of the things I want to say, and, and we don't have time to read the letter, is that when you're serving the Lord, it does you no good to compare and contrast what you are doing with what others are doing. God has given you your gift. He is not going to hold you responsible for what he has given me. You can say amen to that. God has given me my gifts. I am responsible to employ effectively my gifts. God has given you a certain number of gifts that I do not have. And God has given you the responsibility to employ your gifts. One of the things that we must remember is that everybody has someone or some ones over some people over whom they have a sphere of influence. Start there. Start with those that you know, that you love, who love you, and make that your initial mission field. Use what gifts you have to, to do the will and work of, of the Lord. Um, and that is very, very important. Do not compare. Don't waste time in comparing because God has given them their particular gifts. Now, the purpose of spiritual gifts. Let's go quickly to, because my time is getting away from me, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. So I'm in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, and let's pick it up at verse 11. And he himself, I'm in Ephesians 4, reading from the New King James, and he himself gave... Uh, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Um, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, uh, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, the gifts that God gives to his people are for a number of reasons. They fall under the umbrella of building up the body of Christ. Now, there are different ministries. Uh, take Secrets Unsealed. One of the stated goals, aims of this ministry, is to make the body of Christ stronger, more equipped, better informed, uh, more spiritually literate. That's one of the goals of this ministry. So it is a ministry that looks internally to strengthen the body of Christ. Uh, its focus is the body of Christ making us better students of the word, better citizens of the kingdom by informing us of those things that God has for us, particularly prophecy. You'll, you'll note that much of what Secrets Unsealed deals with uh, is prophetic. Uh, the prophetic history of the world, 
the, uh, the world as it is moving now, and of course the, the eschatological end of the world. There are other ministries who put, whose particular focus is evangelism, is going out and making new Christians. Now, anytime you lift up the name of God, you are default evangelism. Uh, this ministry, though its focus is the body of Christ, um, we have numerous reports of individuals who come to the Lord through this ministry because it's, 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 it's so that when you lift up the body of Christ, people are going to come. People are going to understand, even though your focus is not particularly evangelistic, you are default evangelism, evangelistic, because every time you talk about Jesus, people are drawn to Jesus Christ. That's a promise of Christ himself. If I be lifted up, even if I'm lifted up in the church, there are others outside of the church who will hear and be motivated to come. Then the church members themselves will be strengthened and encouraged to go out and do the same thing. So, all of the gifts come from the Lord, and all of the gifts draw people to the Lord and attract people um, uh, to the Lord. I'm reading from the lesson. All are to be employed in Christ's service. In becoming his disciples, we surrender ourselves to him with all that we are and have. These gifts he returns to us purified and ennobled to be used for his glory in blessing our fellow men. That's what God wants to do with us and through us to bless our fellow men and in turn we are blessed. Now in the last few minutes that remain to me. Um, discovering your gifts. These are the things that um, we used to take these spiritual gifts tests about because everybody has something. Um, let's see, I want to look at spiritual gifts. Um, da, da, da. We receive the gifts of the Spirit as we consecrate ourselves to God and ask Him to reveal to us the gifts He has given us. So we need to pray. Lord, show me what I can do for your kingdom. And it is a prayer that he will answer. Um, spiritual gifts are qualities that God imparts so that we can serve him effectively. Ministries are the general areas we can express our gifts in and activities are the specific events that allow us to use our gifts. Spiritual gifts do not come fully developed. I need you to understand that. They don't always come perfective. Now, there are some things people have and they're just good at. They're just naturally good at. Those, when yielded to the Lord, we become sort of experts at that. But for the most part, your gifts develop and improve as you use them for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. You start out one way and you get a little bit better. Uh, case in point, I never thought I was a pretty, a, a, a really good singer. I got to 3ABN and got pushed into singing. And I developed a little ability with it. And a fellow came to me one day and said, you know, you, you need to make a CD. I'll give you a couple bucks to help you on that, on that journey. Um, and I thank the Lord for that. Um, but I would have never gotten to that point had I not used the gifts that I had. I had a little bit of ability to sing. I could sing in quartets. I could sing in choirs. I'd done that all my life. But solo singing was not particularly my strength or something that I liked to do. Uh, but as I did it, I got better at it. I got more comfortable with it. And uh, I got, I guess, good enough that someone said, I'd like to help you uh, make, a, make a CD. So those things you use, you step out of your comfort zone, you work for the Lord, you employ these things for the Lord, and... Um, then God improves those gifts. Uh, Thursday's lesson is growing those gifts. Um, and we don't have time. We've got a lot of things uh, here uh, that we could talk about. But as you use the gifts, again, God will improve those gifts. And you will find yourself better at doing those things that God has called you to do. Let me remind you of something that we started out with. Deeds of kindness, tear down walls of separation, build bridges to salvation. Anybody and everybody can be kind. You don't have to be a student uh, of psychology to be kind. And if you show the kindness 
the love of Christ. Ellen White says we would win thousands where now we only win one if we were kind, tenderhearted, loving, and pitiful. And everybody can do that and let Christ shine out through us uh, by the way we treat our fellow human beings with love and kindness and doing the will and work of God. May God bless you.